Hi, I'm Wayne Brittenden for the Political Compass Podcasts. Was Hitler a socialist? Well, most Europeans would be astonished by the question, but elsewhere, especially in the US, it's quite widely believed that the Fuhrer and Marx were political soulmates. Our guest, Professor Matthew Fitzpatrick of Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia, has written some interesting material on that subject, and many others for that matter. After all, he specializes in international history, German and European history in particular. Welcome, Matt, to the Political Compass Podcasts. Thank you very much for having me. Only one opening question, I guess, that we can possibly have. Was the Fuhrer a lefty? No. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question in the current climate, but no, no, that's certainly not the case. Uh, the Fuhrer was not a lefty. Actually, there's a little bit of conjecture about extremely early on when he was uh, just when he just come back from the war that his his uh, army uh, division had been caught up on the wrong side for him of the uh, uprising in Bavaria. But uh, but he was very firmly in the you know in the right wing camp of German politics for for all of his political uh, career. So where does this misinformation come from? Is it deliberate and coming from certain quarters or has it just sort of gone unchecked for so long in countries like America? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that's going on. I mean, on the first, on the one hand, there's the, uh, the issue, the confusion, I suppose, that comes with the, the deliberate misinformation in the, in the name of his party, the, the National Socialists, the but this, of course, is a misnomer, and, and any any historian knows full well that there was nothing socialist about the National Socialists. Um, but that, of course, has been built on by people, particularly currently, who are who are politically invested, I suppose, in muddying the waters and confusing the issue by trying to uh, discredit, suppose, the politics of the left by somehow linking it to the politics of Nazism. Um, this has a, a thoroughgoing pedigree in the United States. You know, I don't, I don't want to go too much into into naming individuals there. I mean, but I mean, Dinesh D'Souza is one of the, the main figures here that have attempted really to try and paint the left um, as somehow a product of, of of Nazism. And I mean, but that's just simply um, mischievous and, and ill-conceived kind of uh, attempt to discredit political rivals. Well, I mean, the the obvious question to ask people is, uh, do you then hold that the German Democratic Republic was democratic? That's exactly right. And I don't think anybody uh, would, would say that it was democratic in the sense that we would understand uh, democracy or indeed the way in which most people on the, the left thought of democratic republics as being democratic either. Uh, no, you're quite right. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea. For example, you know, there are plenty of examples of uh, polities and of nations that have thrown in something into the into their name in order to um, offer a, a false sense of, of what they're about. Um, I certainly wouldn't think of national socialism as a as a form of socialism. Um, I would certainly see it as a as a as a form of um, hypernationalism. On the other hand, well, weren't among the first people to be persecuted by the Nazis, in fact, the trade unionists, the socialists, and the communists. Yeah, no, you're exactly right there. And in, indeed, when you look at the the, um, the public campaigning, the, the electoral campaigning of the Nazis, particularly in the in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the 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 electoral cycle re they really focused heavily uh, on what they would do to stop communism, what they would do to stop the trade unions, what they would do to stop the social democrats. And uh, this is really, in many ways, the uh, the kind of politics that that saw them become really quite uh, the favourites of the middle classes who were fearful that their businesses and that their property were going to be expropriated um, and really sought, I suppose, in the Nazis a, a very firm sort of anti-communism, anti-socialism. So, um, and you're quite right, once the Nazis came to power, then this, um, this became even more pronounced. So you see, for example, you know, immediately after the first May Day of the Nazi era, the trade unions are more or less um, dismantled, and you see also um, the first more or less prisoners of, of some of the uh, camps, the, 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 the very early concentration camps, are indeed people of the left, people of the, of, attached to communist and socialist parties and the trade unions. So, in fact, 
very early on in the in the piece, it was really those those trade unionists, communists, and socialists who who feared greatly for their fate under the Nazis. That's not to say that um, anti-Semitism was not an, an ever-present feature of Nazism. It clearly was, but it's fair to say that uh, that was more of a popular uh, feature of the party amongst the more sort of rusted-on, hard-right figures uh, within the party. But the thing that makes them, if you like, electorally palatable to many of the middle classes is really their anti-left, anti-socialist platform. And we also know that I think uh, in about 1935, was it, Henry Ford, hardly a socialist, was happy to accept the Nazis gold eagle, the highest award that could be given to a foreigner. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it's interesting to look at the way in which the Nazis are perceived by those both inside and, and but especially outside of Germany prior to World War One, uh, sorry World War Two, and then the way in which they're um, they're viewed uh, during uh, World War Two, there there are some sympathies in some very high quarters around both Europe and indeed in the United States with with Nazi politics, precisely because they are so trenchantly on the side um, of of corporations and and so trenchantly against the trade union movement and indeed um, socialist po and leftist politics more, more generally. George Bush's grandfather, U.S. Senator Prescott Bush, uh, seems to have had a, a pretty close connection too with some of the financial architects of Nazism in his capacity as a Wall Street banker. I'm not an Americanist. I wouldn't go too far into, into who and who wasn't involved in, in the United States with regard to Nazism, but it's fair to say that there are many, uh, certainly within within Germany, uh, industrialists uh, and those who are in charge of large corporations, and indeed those who are in charge of very small businesses as well, who were, were quite delighted by the idea that there would be a, a clamp down on trade union activity and that there would be um, a, an attempt to, to stop the Social Democrats from coming to power. And it has to be remembered, the context within which this is all happening is that the Social Democrats are, are really dominating um, or one of the largest parties in, in German politics at the time. And, and many people are greatly afraid that this would gradually lead to a slide even further to the left within German politics. Because unlike Italy and Germany, so many of the left were either killed off or imprisoned that it was left to principled conservatives to uh, come up with any sort of opposition the Nazis, even though their numbers were small? Yeah, once, once the Nazis are in power, they, because they are precisely because they are so efficient in uh, dismantling and indeed killing, there is really only um, sporadic and in many cases easily suppressed uh, resistance against them. That's not to say there's none at all, but it's certainly the case that the things that we remember are things very late in the end of, uh, towards the end of Nazism. So the, the Stauffenberg plot, for example, an attempt to blow up Hitler. But of course, we do have, um, we, we did have, for example, I think it's a working class uh, carpenter whose name escapes me, who attempts to um, also blow up Hitler at one of his speeches to his, uh, to his old comrades. Um, and of course, we have the, the Scholls. But uh, it's, re it's really quite in interesting the extent to which the Nazis' attempt at Gleichschaltung is successful in, in dismantling any real opposition. And uh, I mean, part of this has been, I mean, been discussed endlessly by historians. Some of the animosity on the, the left, I mean, it, it's fair to say there was no love lost between the Social Democrats and the Communists after their experience of one another during the Weimar Republic, making um, it, it quite difficult for them to... Uh, to, to join forces in, in the face of a common foe, but also simply because the, um, the, the Nazis very early on secured what you might call control over the coercive apparatus of the state, the police force, and also the sympathy of the, uh, of the army. Uh, I mean, the communists, of course, and, and I mean, everybody had their own street militias, the communists, the social democrats, the, the nationalists, as well as the Nazis. And so there was a, a lot of attempt to kind of push back against the Nazis before they're elected, but once they have control of the police force and the, uh, and, and the army remain quiet while the, the SA are allowed to go about their, their business and after them the SS, then really the, it's very difficult for resistance to emerge. And economically, they look clearly like a party of the right. I mean, they got rearmament through 
deficit spending. Uh, they, they actively discouraged demand increases because they wanted the money for investment in the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely the case. Economically, we're really looking at a party that has very early on in its existence pledged to defend the interests of private property, which for many Germans, particularly uh, conservative Germans, is the, the thing they're really looking for. They're looking for a party that is not going to redistribute wealth in the way in which some socialists believe that they could do through taxation and through parliamentary means, nor are they going to do it through revolutionary means, as some communists felt but rather the, the, the Nazis very early on. I mean, I'm, we're talking here from the 1920s on um, are very interested in preserving private property and making sure that the businesses really are in control of their workers. I mean, it's not for nothing that the, uh, the, the Nazis very early on promise businesses that they won't have to worry about an election for, for some time if the Nazis came to power. And it's not for nothing that some of those businesses did pour um, large amounts of money into uh, Nazi coffers very early on. So there is really no way you could say that the Nazis stood on, on a kind of an, an, an anti-capitalist, pro-socialist platform. I mean, we're, we're, even the, some people like to talk about the Strasser brothers as if they're something else and that they were somehow um, uh, socialists and that, and that Strasserism was perhaps a different variety of of Nazism, but really, even if you have a look at what Strasser is saying in 1925, he's already explicitly pro-private property. Um, if you look at um, at some of the conferences of the, I mean, we're talking about, you know, 1923 and 1924, 1925, um, the Nazi Party is firmly in the camp of um, of being pro-business and ensuring that uh, that there is no redistribution of wealth along socialist lines. What you're describing pretty much chimes with the 1983 edition of the American Heritage Dictionary. It describes fascism as a system of government that exercises a dictatorship of the extreme right, typically through the merging of state and business leadership together with belligerent nationalism. How does that sound to you? Yeah, no, I've got some sympathy for that in the sense that there is certainly an attempt for a a very tight um, working together of the of the state and those and businesses and corporations. So that is to say, um, capital. And I mean, you see that in Italy, you see that in Germany as well. Um, this is not an attempt, however, to expropriate these people or indeed to heavily tax them in a way that um, um, that you might see in a in a sort of a, a socialist or a communist country. Rather, we're looking at um, the state working with business to ensure that, for example, that, that workers remain subordinate to the interests of those who own, um, own the means of production, own their factories, own, um, own, own the firms. Uh, so that sometimes the, the word corporatism is used here and you see, for example, Mussolini having his sort of National Council of Corporations. So this sort of state capital nexus, state um, and, and corporation network uh, nexus is, is very, very important. In, um, in, in particularly these two predominant um, states. Now, that's that's very different to the kind of thing you're seeing in, in communist regimes where there is an attempt to simply get rid of um, private property, get rid of corporations as independent entities from the state. So now, in, in the face of the, of the challenge of communists uh, to private property, then many corporations are very happy to, if you like, seek refuge or take cover with a strong uh, fascist uh, nationalist state that will protect them from, you know, the kind of redistrib redistributive inclinations of the left. But on the other hand, once that sort of threat is over, then you then that's when you see corporations become less interested in being involved with the state. Certainly, socially, Stalin and, and Hitler could be said to have quite a few points in common, their sheer authoritarianism, but their economics was scarcely recognisable between each other. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I remember when being, being a, a small small boy and reading kind of Alan Bullock's book about, you know, the one one on Hitler and one on uh, and Stalin, looking at these as sort of twin biographies. And there was, of course, that whole generation of, of history writing in which there was an attempt to mount the so-called totalitarian thesis where in fact 
that, you know, Nazism on one hand and communism on the other were more or less of the same ilk. But um, but I, I'm, I've always been a bit suspicious of that. Um, that's not to say that Stalin, of course, was not horrific in his own way. Clearly, he, he was. And what I, what I would like to do, however, is to ensure that we are able to look at the, the very real differences um, and indeed the real differences in way, the ways in which their crimes come to pass and the reasons why their crimes come to pass. I mean, I think there's no need to try and say that just because Stalin wasn't the same as Hitler, that one was somehow better than the other, but rather what we're looking at is simply um, trying to get a sense of how historically these things came to pass. Um, so nothing is lost by saying that Hitler and Stalin were, were different, uh, but, the, but there's much to be gained by trying to figure out um, uh, how they were different. But you're quite right in the sense that both are both are absolutely interested in in, um, in centralising as much power as they can, um, political power as they can. But on the other hand, one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that Stalin has has very ra radically different economic goals, radically different um, political goals to the Nazis. Now that the fact that both of them end up um, committing major atrocities in the pursuit of their uh, of their politics, well, that's that's incontestable, I think. Incidentally, getting back to the persecution of the left by the Nazis in the early stage of the, the regime, what sort of numbers mm. of people perished at that time from the left? Um, well, I mean, yeah, now this is hard to trace. I mean, because I mean, if we're looking at, at sort of rank and file, um, those sort of numbers are very hard to establish. If we're looking at members of the Reichstag, for example, then um, then you see that a large number of those are um, by the end, certainly by the end of the war, have perished. Many of them languish in concentration camps for uh, for almost the entire duration of the war, and and are only liquidated towards the end. Others, however, are, are killed very early on um, as uh, as Nazism attempts to to take hold. Um, so, I mean, many in the left are able to escape into exile, um, but uh, I, I couldn't give you a, a hard and fast figure on that. But it's it's fair to say that. Uh, Wherever wherever the Nazis encounter um, leftists early on, then they make it very clear that they that their alternatives are to either to leave the country or or to um, face radical persecution, either in terms of um, being imprisoned or alternatively uh, in terms of uh, being killed. Certainly, internationally, Nazism had its admirers, sometimes uh, very uncomfortably. Winston Churchill writing in Strand magazine in 1935 with reference to World War I said that if our country were defeated, I hope we should find a champion as admirable as Adolf Hitler to restore our courage and lead us back to our place among nations. Wow. That was, that was what, nine years uh, after he... Mein Kampf was published? Yes, that's right. And I think, I mean, in that sense, on the one hand, there might not be quite a sense of what it is that Nazism will amount to. Um, one of the things that I quite often say is that Nazism is bad enough in 1933, but the voters of 1933 are not voting for what will happen between, say, 1942 and 1945. But of course, I mean, Churchill is a nationalist who has his own, it should be said, his own misdeeds to account for um, on behalf of the nation is, is of course, quite interested in, in the, the kind of fervent nationalism that the Nazis at least profess to um, to maintain. I mean, we, we have to remember that the, the Churchill, of course, was, you know, at the Battle of Omdurman and, and part of other sort of colonial um, massacres of the of of the British Empire is, is himself no stranger to radical action on, on behalf of the nation. Clearly, nothing um, on the under the scale or, or or the style of of Nazism, but nonetheless, he is an individual who is, as a nationalist, um, deeply impressed by other nationalists. Now, uh, you're right, quite right. I'd, I'd be surprised. I mean, maybe he did, but I'd be surprised if if Churchill had read deeply um, uh, into Mein Kampf, uh, but. Uh, but he would know that he would have seen simply uh, the Nazis as a, a trenchantly nationalist party, and was um, and was probably impressed by that. But I mean, others were as as well around the world in the same way that um, Churchill was. Well, Robert Baden Powell, the founder of the Boy Scout movement, no less, did read Mein Kampf, and he called it a wonderful book with good ideas on education, health, um, care of the aged, and organisation. And propaganda. He liked all of it. Yeah. 
Well, again, I mean, coming from that sort of nationalist and imperial milieu, I'm not surprised to hear to, to hear that that is that is the case. I mean, as somebody, I mean, I've I've had to I've had the misfortune of of reading um, most of Mein Kampf, and it's fair to say that I haven't I haven't found in there anything that would you could take as a as a serious platform for a, for action. Um, and even imagining yourself to be a, a radical nationalist of, of the York of, of the Nazis, but nonetheless, um, I think in some ways the existence of a track like that was was perhaps seen as a as, as something that people could could be enthusiastic of, about if if indeed that was part of their own sort of project, their own political project of of nationalism. But mine come from in really. There's been a new scholarly edition come out uh, of that recently, and um, what you can see very clearly from that is that it's really a hodgepodge of all sorts of, of ideas, um, drenched, of course, in its own anti-Semitism, drenched in its, in its um, fervent hatred of, of not only socialism, but of course, um, communism. Remember the nexus that is being made of this, this so-called um, sort of bogeyman of, of, uh, of Judeo-Bolshevism. This, this idea sort of permeates Mein Kampf, uh, but it, it's really not a, a coherent text in the way we might uh, imagine a manifesto to be. But um, I mean, that it, and it is a work too that, I mean, most Germans, I mean, if you were married in Nazi Germany, then your, the gift you were given by the state was a copy of Mein Kampf, which meant that most families had a copy of it lying around somewhere in the house unless they disposed of it um, very, you know, very quickly. 1940, uh, what, 14 years after the publication of Mein Kampf, Mahatma Gandhi's on record as saying that Hitler's not as bad as depicted. He's showing an amazing ability and seems to be gaining his victories without much bloodshed. Hey, that's Mahatma Gandhi in 1940. Yeah, I mean, we have to read what's going on there. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not a specialist in Indian history or in British history necessarily, but we have to read that, of course, in, in in the light of uh, perhaps a, a desire for uh, liberation from from the British Empire, and there is a there is a sort of a, a, a dalliance of with with, uh, with some Indian nationalists, and I don't know the ins and outs of what you, uh, what Gandhi had to say there, but um, there there is a dalliance with with a number of nationalists who are straining under the British Empire with Nazis and, and Nazism as, a, as a, perhaps a, something that can assist them in their own uh, struggle against empire. Now, I mean, had he read Mein Kampf very carefully, then Gandhi would have seen that, that Hitler rules out, categorically rules out working with uh, nationalists in, within the British Empire uh, in the cause of their liberation, for, precisely because he thinks that the great mistake that that the the Germany of of uh, the Kaiser made was that they had actually upset the British and brought them into World War One. He thinks that if he could keep the British out of a war, then you would then then Germany could conceivably win it. And to that end, he he believed that if he could just leave the British to have control over overseas empire, then the British would probably leave. And he is mistaken. This, of course, that the British would leave him alone to have continental hegemony or continental empire. So we have to be. We have to understand that. I mean that. In, uh, Indian nationalists and indeed nationalists all over the British Empire are looking to not only Nazism but also to the Japanese as potential liberators. Now that's not all nationalists, but there are certainly a number who think that um, that their um, enemy's enemy may well be their friend. The thing that really confuses people, I guess, in history is the difference between Nazism and fascism. And as we explain it, Nazism is a political party platform, whereas fascism is a particular structure of government uh, that will probably sanction the persecution of a particular group within the country, like uh, political, ethnic, religious groups, whatever. Does that sound like a pretty mm. fair description? Yeah, I mean, certainly Nazism is something that is is contained to that German sphere at a particular time and particular um, place. Um, fascism. I know there's a number of sort of different schools of thought about how you would look at um, at fascism, and I know that there are a number of scholars at the moment who are working on a kind of a transnational fascism idea or an international fascism idea, and, and also a trans-temporal one, one that looks at fascism over over time. 
Um, and I, th- I suppose in a kind of a loose street sense, I'm, I, I don't have too many problems with that. My, my only concern, of course, is that, um, that in, in the hurry, I suppose, to label um, all and sundry as, as fascists, sometimes we lose sight of some of the, um, uh, of the difficulties, the, the black spots and indeed the, the crimes of, of liberalism. So whenever, for example, um, uh, democratic, liberal democratic nations do something that people feel is, um, is something that is reprehensible, then there is, a, there is quite often a sense that they, they need to label that very quickly as, as fascism. Now, I mean, for, uh, I, I see fascism as having a fairly specific political and, and economic sort of um, complexion. And for many of the things that have been labelled um, fascism over time and over in, in different places, I, I would see as somehow, as quite often, coming stemming from different uh, political entities that are that are effectively um, liberal, nationalist liberal, to be sure, but um, but, but but liberal nonetheless. So we shouldn't be blind to the fact that um, that not everything that is bad is fascist. It's, it's not just simply a, a swear word or a term to be thrown around, but rather it's a it's a, it's a specific type of. Um, a, a way of describing a state, but you're quite right. I mean, there. I mean, we particularly at the time we're looking at in terms of Nazism, we we have you know Italians, we have Romanians, we have Croatians, we have um, Ukrainians, we have of course Germans and Austrians who who very broadly um, sit within a fascist camp, and many many people would add uh, Franco to in Spain to that to that as well. And now we have within the European Union some very strong fascist elements, don't we, in countries like Hungary? We certainly have some um, some anti anti democratic tendencies there. We have an attempt to, to, and this is where I think this is the interesting interface where we have to try and nail down precisely what it is that we're looking at for when we when we talk about fascism. If we're looking at, for example, the independence of the courts, if we're if we're looking at um, um, the way in which constitutions might be manipulated to um, confirm um, certain political um, uh, victories, then we're starting to look more towards a, um, an anti-democratic entity that, that might well become fascist. Uh, and uh, that's something that is certainly a, a, a worrying tendency across elements of, of Eastern Europe and, and indeed elsewhere. And it's something to be be vigilant against. I mean, I, again, I, I, I hasten to add that um, that that not not everything um, that we see there is is indicative of fascism. Indeed, some of that stuff um, is reminiscent of of some of the uh, some earlier periods of, of liberal democracy that were also unsavoury. But um, but but the blend of the two and the and the the general shift towards an authoritarian politics that. Um, that, as I said, interferes with the judiciary, manipulates the constitution, uses the police in order to to um, to routinely stifle internal um, uh, debate. I, I think those are elements that we can look at as um, as a worrying form of uh, of anti democratic right wing um, um, politics for sure. It seems that the social base for fascism just about everywhere where it sprung up has been the provinces, frightened provincials frightened small town people rather than in the big cities. Hitler really didn't have much of a hold on Berlin or Hamburg, did he? Yeah, I mean, there are there's certainly parts of, of Berlin that um, were fascist, but I mean, there are also parts of Berlin that were very staunchly communist as well. Um, smaller, smaller cities they did well in. I think what happens quite often is that, I mean, it was interesting to see, I mean, if we're looking at the German example, then really we're looking at a, at a march away from a turning of uh, a turning of the back against liberalism and a move towards um, towards Nazism. Those areas that already had a very strong um, alternative to to uh, liberal democracy, um, they actually remained relatively resistant to to the lure of Nazism. So, for example, areas that were staunchly Catholic, strangely enough, despite the fact that Nazis come from Bavaria, but areas that, that voted very solidly for the, for the Catholic Party in Germany, they, they remain um, staunchly sort of rusted onto the, the Catholic Centre Party and their vote. Those areas that were staunchly communist remain staunchly communist. And the same is um, also more or less the same for for social democrats, the the big story, I suppose, of the rise of Nazism is the the disintegration of 
of liberalism as a uh, as no longer seen as a uh, as a viable way of of doing politics, and that of course um, was was in many ways the, uh, the the cohort that that moved towards Nazism. Now they were some of them were in the in the country, and many of them were, um, but some of them were also in the, the kind of the smaller provincial cities as well. We're in very different times now, nevertheless, times that are causing people a lot of discomfort and uncertainty. Is this fertile soil for the rise again of uh, fascist sympathy? Yeah, look, absolutely. There is always that possibility. I think we we have to be aware that, and many people have made this comment before, that the next time that we that a that an authoritarian leader um, comes around, they won't be wearing a um, won't be wearing a military uniform, as indeed Hitler didn't uh, many times when he was um, looking for political office. They won't necessarily um, speak in the way we're used to hearing demagogues speak in the 1930s, and it may not necessarily be um, that, excuse me, that, the, that the, the people that are being targeted are the same as they were in the 1930s. But I think in a period in which um, there is a disillusionment with the, with the politics of liberal democracy and where the, um, the alternatives on the left are struggling to make um, headway, so whether that be social democracy, socialism, or, or even further to the left, then, then the alternatives will be seen by some, particularly those who are worried about um, their economic interests, then the alternatives will be sought on the, on the far right. Um, and um, I think that's something that, that it always pays to be vigilant against. I mean, there, as we rightly said, there is um, there's certainly evidence that people are looking for anti-democratic solutions um, and looking for those amongst radical nationalists. Well, given the systemic failure of governments and governmental institutions to really address the COVID panic successfully, is this the opportunity for demagogues to rise and take over from democratic governments? I think what you'll find is that demagogues and populists, and um, they, they are, of course, opportunistic. And, and whatever, whatever the current crisis is, um, they, will, they will make use of that. And then they will simplify reasons for, the, for this crisis. And they will offer simplistic um, solutions to it that will generally come at the cost of a, of a decided upon um, uh, state enemy or enemy of the people. Now, um, uh, that enemy of the people might might be seen as uh, as being on the left, or it might be seen as a particular uh, ethnic or religious group. But um, but I, I think they're, they're as capable of uh, making use of of COVID as we've seen in in Europe with um, with so-called um, you know free thinker movements in um, in Germany. You've seen them being, uh, they've been colonised effectively by the far right who have been able to in insinuate into uh, people's discomfort and people's anxiety, um, a simplistic narrative about who is to blame and, and, um, and, and what, what needs to be done about that. I, I think that, um, but, th but we also saw that, um, again, thinking of the European example, before COVID, we saw that with the, um, the refugee crisis stemming from, um, from conflict in the Middle East. Um, and indeed from African refugees coming across the Mediterranean. Whatever the crisis will be, there will always be an opportunity and an incentive for, for people, you know, demagogues of the far right, to make use of that for their retail politics and to, to try and turn that into a, um, a crisis that will leverage them into power. Particularly for the libertarian right, there's also an opportunity, isn't there, as young people especially become disillusioned with government's ability to get them out of the crisis. Maybe Bill Gates can do it better. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, this, is the, this is the difficulty that, I mean, uh, libertarian, the libertarian right is a, is, a, is a fairly slippery thing. On the one hand, there is an attempt to claim um, a, a radical distance from the state and to say that they want nothing to do with the state, they don't want to be taxed by the state, they don't want to be subject to the laws of the state. On the other hand, they, they're not above trying to manipulate the the, uh, the tools of the state, that is to say um, election and using um, public institutions in order to further their, their cause. And this is, I, I mentioned earlier, that there is often a, a, a tactical a relationship between capital is what I'm talking about and the state. They, they and the libertarians on the one hand want the protection of the state, 
um, against their, and indeed the assistance of the state against their enemies on the left. And uh, but once that victory has been won, they then want to be um, effectively free of the state and uh, what it does economically and politically to their own um, uh, interests. So, Dr. Matthew Fitzpatrick, thank you for being on the Political Compass podcast, and we hope to have you again one of these days if you're free. Thank you very much.